on the Garden's Corner program. My name is Rob Paul. We appreciate you tuning in. We're brought to you today by T.G. Brooks Company. The Halifax County Fair that's taking place tonight and tomorrow in South Boston. The Halifax County Fairgrounds located behind the South Boston Speedway. Musical entertainment tonight at the Halifax County Fair is Matt Boswell. And then tomorrow, they'll have that bluegrass Saturday. So if you have the opportunity, make your way on over to the Halifax County Fair either tonight. The gates open at 4 this afternoon. Midway opens at 5. Tomorrow, the gates open at 10 a.m. The Midway opens at 12 noon. For more information, HalifaxCountyFair.com. And we're also brought to you by South Boston Memorials. Without further ado, please make welcome the birthday boy himself. Oh, no. Mr. Carl, who is 16, transposed, <laughs> Cantaloupe. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. And a happy 61st birthday to you, Mr. Cantaloupe. Oh, boy. It's just, it's it, time passes by too fast. And you know, Carl, uh, since you are my senior... I don't know if I feel comfortable calling you Carl any longer. Maybe I need to just call you Mr. Cantaloupe. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> just don't call me late for dinner, that's all. <laughs> but, but again, happy birthday. And Thank you. I Thank wish you many more. And uh, anyway, I pick at Carl a, a lot about his age from time to time. And it's all in fun and humor. I don't know if he appreciates it or not. Oh, yeah. But it's, it's, it's all done in, in fun and humor. So, mm -hmm. but, but again, my friend. A uh, 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 big old happy birthday to you. Thanks. Big birthday plans? Not really. You know, it's to me, it's just like another day. You know, uh, I have a, a brother and sister. Uh, they're, they're twins. Uh, they're four years younger than me, and theirs is uh, October the 10th. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. wow, so, so so their birthday will be tomorrow. Tomorrow, that's right. Now, mm -hmm. where do they make their home at, Carl? Uh, my brother is in New Jersey, uh, and my sister is in Michigan. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, that that that's a coincidence. So y'all are four years apart in right. one day. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, we are live in the studio today uh, for the Gardens Corner program. So if you have a question for Carl, uh, please give us a call five nine nine zero two six six. Going to be talking about a, a lot of different things today. Uh, we'll be talking about. Um, mums and, and, and other flowers that you see this time of the year. Um, we'll also be talking about uh, the pine needles falling off of pine trees. And anyway, if you call it, if you've got a question, whatever your question is, we'll pick up on that subject. And um, again, we're brought to you today by T.G. Brooks Company. And we'd like to make mention that in two weeks, We'll be broadcasting live out there for the Gardeners Corner program. Looking forward to that. That will be on the 23rd at T.G. Brooks Company. So make your plans in a couple of weeks to stop by and see us there at T.G. Brooks Company. And again, we're brought to you today by the Halifax County Fair and South Boston Memorials. Uh, Carl, uh, where do you want to kind of jump in and, and start um, today? Well, we can start off with pine needle uh, drop or, or, or needle drop of, of pines. As you can see in the picture here, uh, you see these pine trees and you can see uh, some of the needles turning yellow and that causes a lot of people to get alarmed when they see uh, yellow needles in the pine tree. But uh, if you look, we look at another slide here if the if the needles that are turning yellow are in towards the center of the tree in other words the old older needles the two the two and three year old needles this is a normal process the need, these needles will fall every year uh, around this time in some years we have more more uh, needle loss than others but it's no cause for alarm the tree gets rid of its older needles uh, and you can see in this picture the new the new needles, the ones that are that are close to the tips of the branches, they remain green. As long as you see that, you're fine. Now, if you have uh, new needles, the ones at the tips turn brown. Generally, that is due to a fungus disease, uh, needle cast of pines, it's called. But if you see something like this, it's perfectly normal. And uh, what a good source of mulch this is uh, for your flower beds, uh, just to pick up these uh, 
uh, uh, fallen needles, and they really do make a, uh, a good mulch in your in, around your flower beds. Well, now, uh, Carl, um, I agree. The, the pine needle bedding mm -hmm. is very attractive, and it lasts a long time. And um, when using the pine needles, uh, you know, it's not you don't have the problem of um, the artillery fungus. That's right, <laughs> and 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 also the dog vomit fungus. That's right. That's so, right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it's not to talk about things like that this close to lunch. Hey, we've got a caller. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Garden Corner program. Hello. Uh, I'd like to ask a call about a salad patch. Okay. I got it. Uh, it looked good for a good while, and then it started turning a reddish brown. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to know if it's all right to eat it or yes. what caused it. Yeah, you can still eat it. A lot of times, uh, especially with the rains, it can uh, it can uh, nitrogen will leach out uh, and other nutrients and and cause that discoloration. It's it's just uh, due to nutrients leaching out, but it's fine. To, it's fine to eat. You'll also find that uh, you'll get uh, leaf spots that are going to occur on the. Uh, on the turnip salad, this is a fungal leaf spot. This also is harmless uh, if you want if you want to eat these leaves. That's um, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the best thing to do for that is just clip these leaves and get rid of uh, and use them or get rid of them so that you r reduce the amount of spores that are going to blow and infect the other leaves. But the reddish brown color, it's it's just uh, uh, it's a combination of of uh, fertilizer leaching out and then. Uh, cooler temperatures as well, so so nothing wrong with it. Well, hard to eat it then. No, that, that is correct. He That's said it's fine to eat. Yep. Okay, thank you. Hey, All right, appreciate your call. Calling. That was a good question. Mm -hmm. You know, Carl. Speaking of the uh, of, of the uh, salad patches and things, um, my dad was telling me that he had talked with our neighbor, and he was saying that he was kind of afraid that maybe his salad patch had got drowned. From, from, from all the rain oh, and everything oh, oh. that we had. Oh, definitely. You can actually kill. I remember uh, uh, one person had uh, a, a patch last year, and he had, like, an area where the water would run right through the, the field where the salad was planted and just kill the plants outright. And so th th that, that, can, uh, that can definitely happen. Well, Carl, uh, the, the gentleman, uh, it, it does sound like that, you know, due to all the rain and things that the the, the – the fertilizer and things have leached out. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be worth adding any fertilizer to it? You could, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, just a, just a broadcast application of something like 10, 10, 10. Maybe uh, a pound of that fertilizer per uh, you know 100 square feet uh, would would do fine. Would green would uh, green things up, definitely. Okay. All righty. Again, we are live in the studio today. You can give us a call, 336-599-0266. And um, we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, swamp sunflower. Um, Carl has some of these planted at his place in Butner. And, um, Carl, you actually uh, e e enjoy the beauty of that plant, correct? That's right, yeah. I was just trying to see. Uh, oh, here we, here we go. Uh, before we get on to swamp sunflower, this is if you have um, uh, Cercospora leaf spot on on turnip salad. This is this is what it looks like, uh, and you know if you look at it, it's you know it doesn't look very appetizing, but uh, it's it's really not going to uh, to hurt you. And the best thing to do is get rid of these, uh, you know, harvest these, get rid of the spores that are produced in the in the leaf spot, and then uh, you know. Uh, prevent them from um, I infecting the other plants. Okay. So, All righty. Some uh, some uh, helpful and useful information. And yeah, you know um, that that that's that's one of the things. You know, you you like to make sure that whatever you're eating, it's not going to be harmful. And so um, that's right. We had had someone to call in. I think last week or maybe the week before, and said that they had noticed some discoloration in the leaves of their you know turnip patch and was concerned about it but um anyway call now the the swamp f sunflower mm -hmm. i guess it's a a fitting name because it is actually a plant that really thri thrives 
and high moisture areas, correct? That's right. And I have some some uh, these uh, plants growing at my house, and uh, you see it's uh, they're right at the corner of the driveway. And this is a very very heavy clay soil, and it li and it holds a lot of water. So. Swamp sunflower really likes this type of uh, this uh, condition, and uh, this is the, they're already starting to bloom now, and this is exactly what they look like. Uh, it's a it's a member of the um, uh, uh, the the regular sunflower, the genus and species Helianthus angustifolius, uh, swamp sunflower or narrow leaf sunflower. So it's a it's a relative of the uh, the tall sunflower, and uh, they. Um, they love clay soils. Um, uh, it's a perennial. Can grow, you know, six feet tall or taller with a much branched stem, and rough sandpapery leaves that uh, that are about three to six inches long by a half inch wide. And it flowers this time of the year. Uh, flowers are two to three inches across. Uh, then they start flowering from early October throughout November, when there there are really few other things plants that are blooming at this time. Well, Carl. Uh for those folks that are listening on the radio, they can't see the picture mm -hmm. that people are seeing on uh, TV Channel 10, but they could log on to RadioRoxburgh.com and watch past editions of the Gardener's Corner program. Mm -hmm. um, does the swamp sunflower, is that about as large as it gets, or does it continue to get bigger? Mm -hmm. No, bigger this is bigger? about the size of it getting uh, actually... Uh, probably one of the drawbacks of this plant that if you get a lot of rain, you see how long these uh, these branches are, uh -huh. they fall down. Okay. Um, so you know, kind of uh, in a sense, other than the flowers, resembles is is it called pompous grass? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. It, it, yeah, it has that type of growth. It it yeah. has it has a dense growth, and um, uh, let's see. I think. Well, in this slide, you might see some of the leaves in the center are brown, uh, and actually that's due to drought stress. So if these plants stress for water, they're going to show it right away. But, uh, again, it's, it's nice to use as a border plant, and uh, it really does well. Um, basically, uh, it, it grows much throughout much of the eastern U.S., from southern New York to Florida and west to the Ohio uh, River Valley and to southern Texas. It grows in swamps, wet pine lands, coastal salt marshes, and moist disturbed sites, and is often common along roadside ditches and fence lines. Like most sunflowers, they like full sun. Plants that are grown in partial shade will be leggier and probably fall over without support. And, well, this is what I've found here, you know, in a sunny location as well. Well, Carl, I guess uh, in the picture shown by being planted right there beside of the driveway mm -hmm. when it rains and the water runs off to it yeah. that way it gets extra mm -hmm. water so it does yeah um, but um now call if, if someone wanted to plant the um the swamp sunflower mm -hmm. when, when is the opportune time to do such uh well you you nurseries uh, have them you know they're a perennial so you can buy them in pots you know you can plant them if they're grown in a pot anytime and uh, if you want to make divisions, you can actually take a, a spade and, and slice them up, uh, slice parts of the, uh, the root system up and then replant, and that's best done in, in, uh, you know, in, in late February or, or early March. So you, you can reproduce these very, very easily. Um, let's see, what else it's, uh, can we say about it? It'll grow in uh, in the U the USDA hardiness zones between six to six to nine. We're in zone seven, uh, so it won't survive further north of zone six. It'll um, uh, it'll die. Can't take the uh, really cold cold temperatures in the winter, um, so it can be purchased as a container grown grown plant. And for more plants, you can cut the root mass apart into divisions before you uh, you plant. So. Um, Anyway, that's the that's the swamp sunflower. Well, Carl, speaking of, uh, of planting things, um, uh, here here it is. We're still pretty much uh, in the first third of, of October, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, is it a good time to maybe plant trees? Yes, uh, definitely. If you can plant uh, trees and shrubs now, 
Uh, you go to a nursery and, and you buy them. They're growing in a container. This will give uh, trees and shrubs a, a, a chance to uh, get acclimated to the soil, and uh, the trees can initiate good uh, good root system before the uh, the soil uh, temperatures become colder. Uh, and uh, a lot of people um, uh, make a mistake when they plant uh, trees and shrubs in heavy clay soil. They don't last very long due to improper planting techniques. So when you plant a tree and shrub uh, in heavy clay soils, first of all, remove the root ball from the container and cut the roots with a knife from the top to the bottom of the root ball. And uh, space the cuts about four to six inches apart around the root ball Doing this will eliminate the chance of roots continuing to grow in a circle as they were growing in the container. Uh, roots that keep on growing in a circle after they're planted will cause girdling roots, and these uh, roots, uh, you, we, you have certain roots that grow on top of others, cutting off the circulation of the root below and eventually will kill the plant. So, uh, so uh, take a knife and score the root system um, every four to six inches apart, then take your hands and physically pull apart the root system so that you, so that you encourage the roots to grow out laterally. When, when you plant a tree or a shrub, dig a hole just large enough and deep enough to accommodate the root system. Try to plant it at least at the same level it was growing in the container. If you plant trees and shrubs too, too deep, the, the surface roots, which, um, um, provide oxygen uh, you know to the uh, uh, I should say where the soil oxygen is um, if you if you plant them uh, too deep then the roots die due to lack of oxygen so you want to uh, plant the shrub at least at the same level it was growing in a container or you can actually elevate the root ball up a couple of inches in clay soil so that you encourage water to drain away from the uh, the middle of the plant. In other words, you don't want to leave a basin. Well, I was going to say that when you say raise it up, you mean the upper part of the root ball. Right. It wouldn't be planted with the level, level with the ground. Right. Okay. right. Mm -hmm. I got you. Okay. And eventually it will settle. So that's, uh, that's fine. Um, so uh, elevate the top of the root ball so that it sticks up about two inches above the soil line and uh, mm -hmm. don't make a saucer or a basin around the plant. This causes water to collect it, and uh, adding it will will add an extra amount of water that will stand and cause root rots. Um, if after you plant the tree or shrub, after you uh, elevate the top of the root ball two inches, you can add some mulch, uh, uh, a little bit of mulch around the uh, the root ball. That's that's fine as well, no more than an inch or two. Well, Carl, uh, with with you talking about planting trees. Um, I think it was yesterday on the Old Farmer's Almanac Radio Report, they were talking about varieties of trees that grow rapidly, mm -hmm. and they were saying that it was like a, a hybrid poplar okay. could, could grow maybe like 10 feet a yeah. year and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, one thing I was going, going to make mention of, uh, Leland cypress trees is, is 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 a tree that a lot of people like to plant around the border of their property because these uh, Leland cypress trees they grow very rapidly yes but the only downside to the Leland cypress is when it gets to be very big uh, a lot of times it can't get the water and the nutrients that it needs to survive. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. And usually uh, people get uh, very unhappy when they hear that their, uh, their eight, nine, or ten year old uh, uh, windbreak planting of uh, Leland cypress are dying, and there's nothing that they can do. Because once the tree, uh, these trees are weakened, they can't get enough water and nutrients and then um, uh, fungi move in when the plant is weakened that starts turning the needles brown on the branches and then eventually it kills the plant so actually the better plant to select in this case would be wax myrtles wax myrtles uh, will fill in an area and and provide a good uh, windbreak uh, border planting it, they don't grow as fast as Leland cypresses do but eventually they do get tall and they don't have the disease problems that uh, 
uh, that Leland Cypress is due and, and the great uh, you know amounts of water and fertilizer uh, that they require. The uh, the poplar that you mentioned before, what the probably the type of poplar that they were referring to is called the Lombardi poplar, and these are they are very fast growing, <laughs> and um, they uh, they don't have a very good root system that's pretty weak, so they fall over easily once they get <laughs> tall, and then also diseases take them out uh, like the Leland cypress. So so Lombardi poplar is is not a good one uh, to plant for a, a windbreak, windbreak planting either. Okay. In just a minute, we're going to get a word on for Halifax County Fair. The fair is going on tonight in South Boston and tomorrow. Uh, the entertainment for tonight is Matt Boswell, but we'll take a break and get a word on for the Halifax County Fair. And you know what? If you have the opportunity, go check it out. The 105th annual Halifax County Fair runs tonight through Saturday, October 10th. The Halifax County Fairgrounds is located 1188 James D. Haygood Highway in South Boston, Virginia, right behind South Boston Speedway. Weekdays, the gates open at 4 p.m. Midway rides start at 5 p.m. with Coal Show Amusement Company Incorporated. Saturday, the gates open at 10 a.m. The Midway rides start at 12 noon. Log on to HalifaxCountyFair.com for show times. Enjoy nightly entertainment, and on Saturday, it's a bluegrass Saturday. Enjoy Kermit Wright and the Good Times Band, Molly Rose Band featuring Linwood Lunsford, Lawson Creek Grass, and Daly and Vincent. All this taking place at the Halifax. Highway 360 East in South Boston, Virginia. Your fair, the 105th Annual Halifax County Fair, tonight through Saturday, October the 10th. For more information and show times, log on to Halifax County Fair. Anyway, again, uh, the Halifax County Fair is uh, going on tonight and tomorrow. The gates open at 4 this afternoon, midway at 5, and tomorrow, Saturday, the gates open at 10 a.m., and the midway starts at 12 noon. Anyway, um, kind of moving right along on the topic at hand, um, we were just talking about the swamp sunflower and uh, planting of trees. And by the way, we are live in the studio today, 336-599-0266. If you've got a question for Carl, feel free to give us a call. Uh, Carl, I've uh, got a lot of people already asking about sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, is it time to be harvesting sweet potatoes? You can certainly start harvesting now, especially if you if you have a lot of sweet potatoes that you have to take up. No use waiting for frost warnings. Uh, you might as well go go ahead and get started. But let's see. I think we we, we do. I got think a call. we do. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Gardens Corner Program. Good morning, sir. How you doing? Fine. I got a question on some Bradford pears. I got several little limbs need to be trimmed. Mm-hmm. And with, it's about a now, or either wait till it saps down out of the tree. You can prune them now, and and it'll be fine. Just to get just to get them out of your way, it it won't hurt anything if you uh, if you want to take those off now. That's that's fine. Okay, I appreciate it very much. All right, thanks All right, for calling. Appreciate your call. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Carl, you know, when you were talking a little while ago about, you know, planting trees, you know, the Bradford pear trees, they grow pretty rapidly, yeah. and, and we have some of those planted. But, you know, the unfortunate thing about the Bradford pears, uh, if you have any kind of ice or, or wind, uh, you know, they they can are pretty brittle, so to speak. Yeah, they are. They have uh, uh, the They have narrow crotch angles that form between the the side branches and the trunk in other words they they form at angles that are less than 60 degrees and um, that makes for a very weak weakly attached branch and then when we do get storms uh, they they uh, they just peel down like a banana so um, they are a nice uh, beautiful tree to look at but 
the tree structure and the branch framework is not good. Uh, too many narrow angle crotch, uh, crotches. So um, if at all possible, uh, you know, if you do plant a Bradford pear, make sure that it's away from other uh, buildings, away, uh, a good distance away from the house. So if they do fall down, you're not going to, you know, have damage. Well, Carl, you were telling me a little bit before we went on air that uh, just a few days ago, in in the development that you live in, mm -hmm. you all had a tree to fall down. Yep. Now, was the tree uh, more or less? What well, did it fall for? The reason of the saturated soils or what? Yes, these are old, mature. This is an old, mature pine tree. It's about a hun uh, hundred feet long. And when it came down, you could hear it hit hit the ground, and the uh, the the saturated soil and the wind, you know, just weaken. The roots were probably in a weakened state to begin with, and um, so. Oh well, we've <laughs> oh. got something special going on here. Oh no! <laughs> oh jeez! <laughs> oh, I am speechless. <laughs> don't be don't believe it. <laughs> Oh, this is really nice. Well, a happy birthday, Carl. And, <laughs> thank uh, you, and, 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 and thanks and, to Mrs. Hall. <laughs> anyway, that that was my mother. Yes. Uh, anyway, I had asked her, could she, you know, make a cake for your birthday? Oh, my gosh, and, look at and, that. Uh, that is that actually a delicious. Swiss chocolate cake. Oh. Now, Carl, I enjoy Swiss chocolate cake, and I'm planning on eating some of your birthday cake. <laughs> please do, please now, do. If, if you don't like Swiss chocolate, <laughs> you're just kind of out of luck, so to speak. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really that that is very nice. I need to I need to lift that up to show everybody. Look anyway, at look it, at look at the size of that. Anyway, Carl, uh, that is nice. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when you know uh, when I said something to my mother about fixing you something for your birthday, uh, she asked, uh, "Did I want to get candles?" And I said, no, "I don't think so." I said, "Because <laughs> as old as he is, I said I couldn't afford that many candles." You'll clean out the store. And I said, "If we put that many candles on the cake, it's no way you can make a cake that big." No, no. And I said, "Then if you lit that many candles at one time, it would be a fire hazard." Yeah, so, you'd have to call the fire marshal. That's so right. So that's pretty much a cake with no candles. But but again. A happy birthday, my friend. Thank you. I appreciate yes, it very much. Hey, let's get a word on for T.G. Brooks <laughs> Company, and we'll be back in just a minute on the Gardener's Corner program. But, again, we'll be broadcasting live at T.G. Brooks's two weeks from today for the Gardener's Corner program. Hey, the leaves are falling. It's October. Fall season is upon us. Warmer days, cooler nights. T.G. Brooks Company has your pansies too for fall beauty. It's still time to plant your turnip seed and also your kale, mustard, collards. And more importantly, it's time to sow the yard and do fall planting. There is no better time of the year to reseed and refeed your lawn. T.G. Brooks Company has plenty of advice and plenty of supplies too. Enrich your lawn and your yard with Lime, fertilizer, grass seed, including the new Top Choice Turf Grass Seed for greener and plush lawns. Many people have been to T.G. Brooks and picked up or had delivered beautiful mulch, including some of the triple ground mulch, and they have mulch in several colors. It is also time to do some raking. Get your lawn rakes and your tools to do the work. No matter if you are the individual homeowner or you are the professional landscaper, T.G. Brooks Company gives the same courteous attention to everybody. Fall in this time of the year, also the time to check over your stovepipe needs and fitting needs. Also, they have your replacement parts for Taylor wood stoves like blowers, anode rods, rust inhibitors, chemicals, and pumps. Next month, we'll be celebrating Thanksgiving. Keep in mind, T.G. Brooks Company will have your Thanksgiving delicious, famous T.G. Brooks Country Ham. So plan now to put that on your shopping list for later on. From cast iron cookware to case pocket knives, from grocery needs to plumbing supplies to electrical supplies, they have it and have plenty of advice, especially for your lawn and garden. Don't forget to pick up hand-cut ribeyes. Take them home and pop them on the grill after a hard day's work in the yard. T.G. Brooks Company, thanking you for your business and looking forward to serving you 
Phone 364-2428. Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program brought to you today by T.G. Brooks Company. Also brought to you by Halifax County Fair. We've heard from both of those folks or those places, I should say. And in just a few minutes, we'll hear from South Boston Memorials. And um, again, um, it's a uh, special day for Mr. Carl Cantalupe. His thank you so much. Today. Thank you and, for the... Uh, and thank anyway, uh, Carl, uh, back to... Uh, we were talking about the tree that it fell in, 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 in your yeah. development, mm -hmm. and you all had to get, you know, a, a tree company to come out and remove it and, and things, and you said that it had pretty much uh, failed due to the saturated soil. Yeah. Well, I've been seeing some on the news uh, this past week about how the um, all the, the rains and everything had done a tremendous amount of damage to the peanut crop and okay. also tobacco crops and things like that. Um, I have not heard any word on how it has affected the sweet potato crops. Have you heard? No. So uh, hopefully it, it won't be. It, yeah, it, it, it should. You know, the uh, as long as you the, the soils don't uh, remain waterlogged, and that, ca that can cause problems with sweet potatoes, you know, starting to spoil in the ground, I suppose. But... Um, but anyway, now's, now's the time to think about uh, digging your, your sweet potatoes up. I have a few slides here that shows um, uh, actually a sweet potato digger, how it, how it lifts them up and, and uh, puts them on, the, on top of the ground. Here you see uh, some sweet potato roots that, are, that have uh, been dug up. Uh, here's some, some roots that uh, shows you how they how they form on the plant and uh, the, of course the roots are the soil is, are, is washed away from the roots to show you that and um, here's another one that shows uh, uh, sweet potato uh, being harvested and then uh, drying them in the sun on wire screens you can also take if you have a hobby greenhouse you can also lay them out in the greenhouse to uh, to dry or this is the process that's known as curing and uh, after you dig the roots, uh, be careful not to damage them uh, to, so that you don't cut them um, and make more wounds than necessary. But uh, bring them into a warm, dry area. Let the soil fall off the roots naturally. Don't rub the soil off, otherwise the tender skin will be pulled off. And uh, the curing process consists of placing the roots in a warm closet uh, in your house uh, using a space heater where the temperature can be raised to about 85 degrees and then place a pan or basin of water in the closet so that you'll create high humidity conditions about 95 percent. This procedure is known as curing which heals the cuts and bruises on the roots from digging and toughens the skins. Uh, after a week check the roots by rubbing the skin of the sweet potato lightly with your thumb. If the skins come off easily, then put them back into the closet to cure for a few <coughs> more days, then recheck. Uh, after curing, store your sweet potatoes in a warm, dry area at room temperature. Never store them less than 55 or 60 degrees, or chi uh, chilling injury will occur that will lead to premature breakdown and spoilage. And never store sweet potatoes in the refrigerator. Uh, if you don't uh, cure sweet potatoes, expect about 20% of the sweet potatoes to rot due to them not being able to develop a tough skin. So that's a little bit about uh, uh, sweet potatoes. Know that they, they do like a warm, dry storage. Never refrigerate them. And, and one thing, when you harvest your sweet potatoes, if you use a a potato plow to pl plow them up with. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have some potatoes that get cut uh, when you plow them up, don't don't throw the potato away. The the sweet potato is pretty good about self healing, and and then when that potato dries, when you peel it, you still have a a good potato. It may not be as pretty as you would like. But if, if you're one that raises sweet potatoes to sell, I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. But uh, you need to uh, grade your potatoes out because you'll find a lot of people likes the baking size potato. And, and then you've got some people that likes to make uh, a lot of um, 
for the sweet potato pies and things like that. And you can use your larger potatoes for that. So basically, when, when, when you're boxing or bunching your sweet potatoes for sale, you know, you can maybe have like first qualities for one price. And then you could have some number twos and number threes mm -hmm. for more of a reasonable price. And, and, and that way you could, you know, get more of a premium price for, for your first grade potatoes. Wouldn't you say, Carl? Right. And, and, I, and I know uh, the, some of the federal USDA grade standards, there's U.S. number one, U.S. number two, jumbo, and uh, can, canner is another, another right. classification. Uh, all, all, all different grades, that's right. But, but you know, uh, no matter the size of the sweet potato, whether it's a small potato or a huge potato, it, it, it's, if, if it's a good variety of a sweet potato, it's going to have the same taste. But just depending on uh, a lot of people around here like baked sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandmother used to bake them. And she would just, you know, put them on a baking pan and, and put them in the oven and bake them that way. A lot of people nowadays uh, wrap them in foil before right. baking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's, it's a lot of different ways and it's a lot of different things that you can uh, use the sweet potato for. And, mm -hmm. and, and it can it is actually considered a vegetable, I would say, but it's usually used as a dessert item correct Carl that's right and here's a, a shot of some varieties some common varieties that we grow here uh, some we do grow here others we don't but uh, let's see I, I guess we have a we have a call we do we do good morning thank you for calling the gardens corner program yes sir this is not on the sweet potato but I need to know some okay All right. on grapevines uh, one that's already planted and you would love to move it uh, to a different location, a better location. When is a good time to move a grapevine? I would wait. I would wait until it was dormant. Probably, probably in 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 February, with some time, would be fine. Okay, that's what I need. I certainly appreciate it. Hey, appreciate hey, thanks you for Carl. calling. Thank in. you, mm -hmm. uh, Carl. Uh, yes, you know, uh, we, we were talking earlier about planting trees. Uh, is it? Is it? And we're we'll gonna jump off of sweet potato in just a moment. And a gentleman mm -hmm. asked the question about grapes. Is it a good time to plant grapes? Well, you probably can't find them uh, now to plant unless unless you go to a nursery that, you know, that you have them growing in containers. That yeah, you can plant those anytime. But for for dormant, bare rooted, uh, you know, uh, grapes, uh, you you'll get those from um, fruit tree nurseries, and they generally ship in the in the spring. You know, and they ship them in the mail before they start to grow. So, so if you want a large selection of varieties from uh, nurseries, they're going to ship them dormant, uh, bare root in the spring. Okay. All right. Uh, for those folks that are listening to the Gardens Corner program by way of the radio, uh, you're na unable to see the uh, the uh, picture of the sweet potato varieties that Carl has up on the uh, TV screen. Right. But uh, we invite all of you at your leisure to log on to RadioRoxburgh.com and you can watch past editions of the Gardener's Corner program and you can see on, on the internet a lot of these pictures, you know, that you're not, unable to see on the radio. But right. Carl, by that picture, it looks what maybe about 10 or 12 different varieties right. of sweet potatoes. Right. We've got uh, orange flesh types, white flesh types. And uh, and purple ones as well. So uh, these are these are what they look like, you know, uh, bef before they're cut. And, and you have Puerto Rican, Covington, Beauregard, and and we'll go through each of these individually. I have them uh, featured individually. So this is what the what the flesh looks like, you know, af after they're cut. Uh, here's the Covington, uh, which is a uh, an orange flesh type, one, very popular uh, variety that's grown. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, after it's sliced, what the flesh looks like. Uh, Beauregard is a very popular uh, orange flesh type uh, variety, the ones that generally people call yams. Um, Hernandez is another orange flesh type uh, and has kind of a, a deeper orange color than the others. And then, uh, then we have a purple sweet potato here. And uh, when that's cooked, it really, really looks nice, uh, that nice uh, deep uh, purple color 
Uh, here we have uh, the Puerto Rican, which is kind of a, a lighter, lighter flesh color. Uh, I guess you could probably consider this an orange uh, flesh type as well. But then the O. Henry is a white flesh type, and you can see the difference uh, in in that one when it when it's cut. Now, they they do say that uh, the the moist the moisture content is actually higher in the white flesh types than they are in the uh, in the orange uh, orange colored ones for for some reason. Well, Carl, um, you know, I, I've never tried many white sweet potatoes. They're more popular in the north. Yeah. Um, but um, what I was going to, to say about the varieties of the sweet potatoes that, that you were showing, um, I've never tried the purple sweet potato. Ha have you uh, tried that no, before? No, no. Uh, one thing uh, that some of the, the folks that are listening that would maybe like to plant sweet potatoes next year is um, you have to have sweet potatoes uh, to plant your potatoes for the following year. Right. And, and, and what you basically have to do, you have to fix a little bed, and you plant these sweet potatoes from this year that maybe you've just harvested, maybe save some of the smaller potatoes. Mm -hmm. and, and you plant them, and you just have like a, a little small coat of uh, soil on top, Mm -hmm. Well, when the transplant comes up, you pull the transplant and you plant the transplant for a sweet potato. Right. And, and, and it's a little bit confusing because when you plant Irish potatoes, you actually plant the tubers. Mm -hmm. But for a sweet potato, you have to plant the actual plant. The shoot or the slip, as it's, uh, as it's called, and you can see in this picture, that uh, the shoots form have a tendency to form at one end of the sweet potato. So you break these off and then you, you plant these slips, as they're called, in an amount of soil that's already about uh, 10 to 12 inches tall. The reason being is that the sweet potato roots grow downward. So uh, you want to have that nice soft mound of soil there uh, and you plant the slip right at the top so that the uh, roots can move uh, uh, very easily through uh, uh, through the soil and not be obstructed. Well, Carl, with that being said, what came first, the sweet potato or the sweet potato slip? <laughs> uh, good, uh, good question. Probably the um, uh, the the seed. Uh, you know, uh, the seed. You know, of course, gives rise to the uh, uh, the plant. So there were probably seeds. You know, that were found s some somewhere. Okay. Mm. Well, that, that, that's uh, interesting, the way that the difference, and, and, and you have said in the past that a sweet potato is not really considered a sweet potato. It's a part of the morning glory family? The morning glory fla uh, family because it has a, f a flower that looks just like the, uh, the annual morning glory flower that you plant. And uh, uh, most, most years uh, you don't see the sweet potato actually flower because it depends on day lengths but if you if you go down to the equator where it's uh, you know 12 hours of, of daylight the sweet potato flower is very very often down there but every so often you will see it flower here but okay. it ha you ha it has to be you know 12 hours of day length okay we need to get a word on for South Boston memorials they're one of our five supporting sponsors today here on the Gardeners Corner program and we appreciate each and every one of our sponsors. And should you ever have the opportunity to send some business the way of our sponsors, we would appreciate you letting them know that you appreciate them supporting the Gardener's Corner program. But we'll get a word on for South Boston Memorials, and we'll come back and we'll wrap it up on the Gardener's Corner program. But right now, we'll take a trip to South Boston and stop in at South Boston Memorials. South Boston Memorials, located 1439 Seymour Drive in South Boston, Virginia. They offer granite markers, monuments, and mausoleums. 
For more information, visit the website SoboMemorials.com or call 434-572-3859. South Boston Memorials have been in business and family-owned since 1958. In-house laser etching is available at South Boston Memorials. They have over 300 granite memorials in stock. For all of your granite markers, monuments, and mausoleums, stop in and see them right there at South Boston Memorials, located 1439 Seymour Drive in South Boston, Virginia, or call them at 434-572-3859 and visit the website soboatmemorials.com. That's South Boston Memorials, located 1439 Seymour Drive in South Boston. Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program. My name is Rob Hall, Mr. Carl Cantalupi, our resident expert. Uh, we appreciate um, his knowledge. Carl, we've got just about maybe about three or so minutes left on the program today. Okay. Um, any kind of um, uh, other comments or closing remarks you'd like to make? Yeah, maybe we can uh, uh, talk a little bit about, uh, real briefly, about the uh, the brown marmorated stink bug. We That's a great idea because I've been seeing them. <laughs> I, and recent. people have been calling, and this is what they look like. And uh, if you uh, you see uh, these have uh, uh, ba the anten the antenna are have two bands of white on them, and they have prominent markings on the edge of the insect, the wing covers, uh, contrasting that with the brown stink bug uh, that is more darker in shape. But these are very uh, pr pretty easy to control. You can use a uh, an insecticide called Talstar, T-A-L-S-T-A-R, and spray that around the foundation of your house and to keep them from coming in. Uh, they're just they're looking for places to hibernate, and so uh, if you do that, uh, you can control them. Uh, there's some more pictures of them here, a and they can cause quite. Uh, havoc with the uh, apple growers in western in the western part of the state be because they will sting the fruit and may and just render them uh, uh, useless so here here's uh, here is a uh, an, a shot of an apple that's being st that was stung with a stink bug and you can peel away the surface and you can see that the apple will rot fairly quickly and if you don't believe that they are really a stink bug when you find one, go ahead and crush it, and then you will see why they call yeah. it a stink bug. Yeah, you see in this in the map of this of North Carolina, you see they're they're mainly found in the west, but they are they have migrated eastward, and uh, you see them uh, you know in in Wake County's uh, Wake County below us, uh, and I'm sure it's just a matter of time where where we'll see more and more of them. So so just be uh, just be on the lookout uh, for them. And what is the chemical, chemical name again to uh, use? Talstar, T-A-L-S-T-A-R, Talstar. Okay. okay. Well, that's going to about do it for this uh, birthday edition of the Gardener's Corner Program. <laughs> Thank you. Again, happy birthday to Mr. Carl Thank Catalupi. you, Rob. Appreciate Thanks that. goes out to our fine supporting sponsor, South Boston Memorials. We also appreciate the support of the Halifax County Fair and T.G. Brooks Company. I want to wish you and yours a happy and safe weekend. And uh, next Friday, we will have a recorded edition of the Gardener's Corner program. But we'll be back live on the show in two weeks as we'll take the show on the road to T.G. Brooks Company. That will be on October 23rd. Again, thanks to Mr. Carl Cantalupi of the North Carolina Cooperative you, Extension Rob. Service. We appreciate our camera operator and technical assistant, Mr. David Bratcher, Jr., as we affectionately know him as Kilby. On behalf of those two gentlemen and myself, Rob Hall, again, thanks for tuning in to the Gardener's Corner program.